Hey everybody, thanks for coming. My name's Eric King. I'm a landscape architect. I own a design build business called King Landscaping. And I teach landscape design at Emory University. We started a landscape design certification class a few years ago. And what that's really helped me do is understand the steps that we all do already, but when you have to teach, when you have to explain and articulate what you're doing, suddenly it makes you really, really dissect it and try to figure out, well, well why, how do I know to put the patio right here instead of over here? What's, what's the underlying reason? I know it. Intuitively, I feel like it's the right spot. But how do I know that this arbor that's already here is, is just uncomfortable? It's too low. Why does, it, why does it feel awkward? Why do I not want to be in this space? So what I really have learned is that what I do outside, which is mostly outdoor landscapes, anything once you walk outside the door, outside landscaping is really just space planning for the outside. Do we have any interior designers in here? Do we have any space planners, people who really, all right? Remodelers, all right? So when you remodel, do you work from, how many people, uh, how many of you design your own, have done your own remodels based on your own plans or your own ideas? Okay, how many have followed other people's plans? All right, what was, which has a higher success rate, your own or somebody else's? Little, your own, right? So there, there can be a separation between the design and the build process. There's an isolation. If you only design all the time, you tend to lose touch with how do your spaces actually feel. Because there's not a lot of post-occupancy evaluation, evaluation if you're design only. Do you go back and look at all your designs that somebody else built and critique them? Typically that doesn't happen. If you're installing your own spaces, you know painfully what works and what doesn't. You are confronted. So there's this constant feedback loop. So what I'm really focusing on today is what is outdoor space planning and what does it really mean? So we're going to look at this, these group of these words right here. We're going to look at a program for the outside, much like you do for the inside. What are the floors, walls, and ceilings made of? And how do codes come into play? Because most of us are familiar to a degree with codes, but they're similar but different outside. So how do you adjust for the codes outside if you're outdoor space planning? All right, first is just get with the program. When you're doing an inside renovation, the program is spending time with the client and figuring out what it is they want. And it's not necessarily, in fact, it's often not what they tell you they want. They tell you a series of ideas and images, but it's, sometimes they don't match. I've had somebody tell me they really liked modern and contemporary landscapes, and they showed me pictures of this sort of cottage-style, arts and craftsy space. So the picture is what's important. The picture is what really tells you what they really like, not their words, because words can have multiple meanings. So you walk around the yard, just like you would inside, and say, what do you like? Show me pictures. What's good? What's bad? What are the problems? How much room do you need? What are you going to do outside? Do you want to have a grilling area? Do you want to have parties? Do you entertain a lot? Same things you ask inside. Then you have to analyze and inventory the site. And those are two different things. And a lot of times we get them confused or they sort of get muddled together. If you're going to analyze a site, that's that has more feeling. That's like, what do I like about this space? What do I not like? What feels good? Inventory is just a checklist. How tall, how wide, how big. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you create a design with the survey as the base map. And I don't do a design without a survey anymore. I just don't do it because there are so many problems. Do you remember when they used to require you in Georgia when you bought a home? You had to have a survey. And that was really pretty smart. The problem with that is it showed problems in the yard. It showed fences that were off. It showed driveways that were on other people's property. And I think it created issues um, more for the people who were actually selling the home than the buyers. But I really recommend always, always starting with a survey. All right, so let's look at what, what does that mean then? So the first thing is, as you walk around the yard, you're going to talk to the clients about what the program is. Well, right now, those steps are they're, they're 
riser over run, it's awkward when you walk up it because they're like one and a half steps deep. So as you're walking up, you have to take one step and then a half step and then one step and then a half step. So they don't really understand it. They just know they fall down their stairs, they trip. It's, it's awkward. Uh, they're worried about that wall that's leaning to the side. They don't like the views as they walk up. But there's a lot of things wrong with it. So that's the difference between inventory and analysis. If you're looking at this picture and you walk outside with them, they might say, you know, we really just don't like to sit here. We don't know. We just don't like to sit down here. We have a nice finished basement, but we never come outside here. Well, there's a lot of pieces to why that is. Some of them are, as you're doing this site, you're just going to inventory. So you look at, well, it's just a concrete slab. It's right up against the house. The windows outside are pretty low, so you just note as you're doing it, you're going to have to keep things, plants that grow at a certain height, so you need to know where the window heights are. You can look up and see the exposed side of the rafters. Uh, some of those are inventory. That's a checklist. What is an analysis is why, what feels good or bad about that space. So under a deck, for example, one thing you don't want to know if you want to create a room under a deck is that you have created a room under a deck. So what you have to do is change the perception of that space. So as a designer, you can get to how you do that. The first step is, what is wrong? Why are they not sitting out here? Some of that is, is it too small? Is it too narrow? This has enough room. So why aren't they sitting? Why wouldn't they want to be out there? Well, who wants to sit on a concrete slab under a deck? There are ways you can change that. Uh, this is probably pretty typical where you have the concrete that follows the profile of the deck. So it's almost in a shadow line going straight down of the deck. Well, all that does is take that floor plane and draw your eye right up. So immediately, you change the floor plane, push it out into the yard. Draw it out in the best view out into the yard. Don't follow the shadow line of the deck. That's irrelevant. The overhead plane is irrelevant in this case. All right. The other thing is there's a post right in the middle of your view. It's like you're looking at a bar, like out of a prison cell. That's your, that's your view. So then you, how do you adjust that? What does it take to move a post? All right, there's structural engineers, but there are definitely ways you can do that. Why would you want to do that? Think of your living room looking into your kitchen. If there was a post right between the two, how, how would that feel? Nobody would, you, you don't see that. You would never see that inside. So in terms of your site analysis, What's wrong with that space, OK? Uh, so those are a couple things. The other is the rafters are, look like rafters. If you spray painted them all a dark walnut, a dark, dark black color. A lot of restaurants do that when they have pipes and all kind of busyness going on. Paint it black. Make it disappear. Your goal is to draw the eye out. But it starts on the very first visit or the second visit when you have time to be alone. One of the things you have to learn, this took me a long time, is uh, I'm really honest with people right up front. So I tell them, yeah, we're going to talk, and then you have to leave me alone. Because I'm going to walk around your yard, and I, I need to know how it feels. I need time to think. Because, you know, they're going to want to follow you around and give you all kind of input. And there is a time where that has to stop. If you really want to understand what a space is, you have to be in it for a while. And that's part of the analysis phase. These, this. Uh, won my award for literally having everything you could possibly have wrong with a set of stairs. They are different heights. They're different depths. They pitch left to right. They pitch right to left. There's no handrail. Everything about them is wrong. I love the wall there on the right side. They, it started to fail, so they took strips of metal. It's like a Frankenstein wall, and they bandied it together. That's what's holding it together. And we joke about that with the client. He knows it's bad. So it's, but that's a, that's part of that is an inventory and part of its analysis. Why would you not want to walk up it? Well, what's your view when you walk up it? It's kind of hard to see, but you see what's at the top there? It's just a bush. If, if you're going to put it back in the same spot, well, maybe you need a pot. Maybe you need a, a nice focal point. Why do you not like those stairs? Part of it is that there's sort of a death trap, okay? The other part is that who would want to walk? There's nothing appealing. There's nothing drawing you up into that space. That's the difference between inventory and analysis, and they're both incredibly important. All right, this space has a lot of cute pieces, and pieces are the hardest thing. Big picture is the hardest thing of all. 
There are a lot of people who can do pieces. Uh, there's a lot of websites that show you pieces. How to turn a tire into a planter. People love that kind of stuff. How to, whatever it is, how to, un, how to peel a hard boiled egg in 10 seconds. All right, there's those little snippets. And I think we like it because we can get our head around it. So there's a lot of pieces here. They've got boxwoods that sort of frame the entry. They've got stone walls. They've got a lot of furniture in there. And it's a dark, uninviting space. That's just one. Why They say they never spend time out there. So you can inventory where everything is, and then you have to do the analysis. What is wrong with that space? Too busy, too much, too dark. So when we get a plan, we've got a, I've got a system now that's uh, brutally simple. Uh, kind of just forced over time to do it. So I always start with a survey. I enlarge it to the scale I want to work with outdoors, which is typically 10 scale. And then I trace on top of it. I take the 10 scale survey with me to the site. And I actually, while I'm out there, note everything on the plan to scale. I have a ruler. I have a, so I have a scale. And I have a tape measure. So I locate trees. I locate hardscapes. So after the client meets with me, we agree to the design fee. We come back. I have this enlarged. I do my site visit in about 45 minutes. Uh, and that can be for an installation up to several hundred thousand. So it's just, but the, the key is having the survey, a good updated survey. Uh, in almost every municipality now, you're going to need to know where trees are, you're going to need to know impervious surfaces, and you're probably going to need contours. And that could be 1500 bucks for a survey. Years ago, if you were going to do contours, some of, the, some of you guys remember me how much a survey was 20 years ago before GPS. If you were going to do topo, it could be five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 and trees. But now they locate them all with GPS. And then we put color on top of it, label it, boom, we're done. This is not a permittable document. First step is we talked about your ideas. Here's the plan. What do you think? So this is a color plan. Here's one version. This is an AutoCAD version that somebody colored up. I don't use AutoCAD a lot unless I already have a base map. It doesn't really matter what your tool is. I know for some of you that's sort of may not be comfortable, but a good idea is a good idea is a good idea. If you understand what you're doing, you can do the best looking plan on a napkin. There are, interior, there are uh, landscape architects uh, for years, uh, one in particular that designed on a 11 by, uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of legal paper, yellow legal paper. She would do her designs, some of the best designs in the city. She's done hundreds of them. Or there's eye candy. Now, this is really useful. The technology is really beneficial for showing your concepts, to helping people understand what you're trying to do. But it will not compensate for you not understanding what you're going to do. And that all goes back to the initial program with the client, and it goes back to you understanding what the site has to offer and what you can do with it. So in this case, they wanted an outdoor screen porch and then they had a downstairs elevation that was walkout, and we created an intermediate node. We had a lot of things going in different directions, so we created a landing midway that was more like an intermediate room, sort of like a mezzanine, uh, something in between. I uh, prefer not to use the word purgatory, but it's that sort of a parking space to go from different places. But what it also does is compensate for eight and a half feet of elevation change, so you don't have eight feet of stairs in a row you instead have four feet of elevation change, a little bit of a landing, and four feet. So basically, we brought the ground plane up so you don't just have eight feet of deck steps, wood deck steps. But that was part of understanding why they didn't like the space. It was too much separation. All right, so rooms are rooms are rooms are rooms. They all have the same components. They really do. Floors, let's start with that. It's pretty basic. They should blend with the other elements in your space, but not dominate it. I still remember a home I went into. I was working with a renovator. They were doing the inside. I was doing the outside. And they brought me in, and they were so proud to show me these black, black hardwood floors. And that was the first thing I noticed, and that is still all I remember about that house. I'm sure there was other great details. I remember the black floors. But that's not the first thing you should remember. That's not, that's not the takeaway from your design. Floors are part of a composition. The overall effect is 
What a great room. What a great house. I love your house. What a great yard. I love your yard. Not when you walk out, the first thing is, oh, what a beautiful floor. You've got the priorities wrong. You're designing a composition. But every room starts with a floor. You can change materials and or levels to create different rooms. You do that inside, you do that outside. All right. So if you've got a big space in the house, you can have two steps that help articulate one room from another. You can change material. One material in the kitchen, one material in the living dining room. Same elevation, touch each other. The floors help distinguish the two rooms. Okay, pretty basic, right? And it's either a room or a hallway. That's a big deal inside, too. You don't, you, you've done it so much if you design inside that you stop thinking about it. But what I found outside is oftentimes those distinctions get blurred because it didn't start with space planning. The idea of designing your outdoor space, again, based on a room concept. If you focus on what is a room, what is a room, what is a room, that will help you design outside. So for example, these are a pavers, these are a Dublin cobble. Anybody use those? Um, they're a right, uh, range of colors, a couple different sizes, but they're blends. I like blends a lot because matching is really, really tough. If you're going to try to match any one thing, probably the same inside, if you're going to try to match two colors exactly, you've got to get it spot on, the tints, the hues, the light reflection. <laughs> but if you have something that has a range of colors in it and a range of shapes, it's going to go with a lot more things. It'll pick up. Some of those colors will match. So with pavers, there's some earth tones, there's some grays. It picks up on the cushions, on the paint, on the stone. It's a blender. I personally have gone to more pavers because what, is, what are the three things they say about concrete? It will crack, it will crack, and it will crack. So anytime you do concrete, it's going to crack. Everything on concrete that has concrete is going to crack. If you do bluestone, mortared bluestone, it's on mortared bed, it's on concrete. It will crack. There is no question that it will crack. The only question is how long will it take? So that's an important thing to relay to the client. If somebody loves bluestone, Buckhead, Boxwoods, Bluestone, I get it. The three Bs, uh, sure, absolutely. But as a designer, I feel compelled to say it's going to look great. It's going to crack. It won't be a safety hazard, but as water gets under it, it's going to pop loose. Might be five, might be 10 years. We can come back and repoint the joints. But that's part of the education process. Because a lot of us have been doing this. I know some of you all in here, we've been doing this for decades. And we're going to continue to do it for decades, so uh, Lord willing. So it's important to be honest and then put the decision back on the client. So I've gone to pavers because they won't crack. They're pre-cracked. They're on a compacted base. They have this polymeric sand that sets up like concrete. So that's, that's a choice that I've used. But it's still a floor that blends. All right, here the room has the umbrella in the center. You can barely see the deck steps off to the right that you're going to go up to the porch. So that space in between needed a filler. So we used a stone with dwarf mondo grass between it. We designed one room, which is where the umbrella is. We designed the other room, which is the deck. But we know there's going to be a lot of flow into the yard, so we have a stone that blends that cut crab orchard that picks up some of the other colors. But it's not the room. It's the hallway. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So the rooms are very distinctive. You start with where the rooms go, and then you figure out where the hallways are. All right, swimming pools for decades had the concrete donut around them. It's like you built the pool, then you do about six, seven, eight feet of concrete all the way around. Well, wh where are the rooms? Where, did you, where do you want people to sit? How many places do you need to sit? What are you going to do while you're sitting? Deck chairs, lounge chairs area, OK. Uh, comfortable table, you know, sitting up, uh, and maybe a casual sitting area with the love seat and the cushions. And the, so I found, honestly, it gets to be a maximum of about three rooms comfortably outside. But in this case, it was a big lot. And instead of filling the whole yard up, we created one room at the end. And then we have stepping stones that make the hallways. They help connect. But also the colors blend. Back to the floor is not dominating. That's a, a colored concrete with a little bit of an exposed aggregate. It picks up the colors of the stone, of the mulch, of the plants. It's part of a bigger composition. All right, so once you change elevations, clearly separate rooms. All right, that's partly a separate room because it has a floor plane, but by lifting it up and making it taller, no question, it's a separate room. 
It's a great room, too. All right, here's the view looking back. Again, the materials blend. The brick on the house uh, is reflected in some of the colors of the concrete. The stone, it, it's all unified. The boulders in the background, it's all part of a composition. But changing the floor plane makes that covered area a separate room, one of pieces that make it a separate room. All right, so rooms and hallways. And there's a couple things about this picture. This is brand new installation, so the boxwoods are still growing together. And I love this. The, the, the client put those lights out, those string lights. Can you see them that are top of this little courtyard? And it was a, a series of sort of an amoeba-like patio. It had stone going in all the different directions. There's actually three doors. Well, four total if you create the one in the foreground, those stepping stones. But coming out of the house, there are three doors that lead into that room. So imagine furnishing a room that actually has four exits or entry spaces. It's really tough. Well, one of them is to a bedroom, that one on the left. There's one in the back right corner that they never used. The main one is the one on the right side. So we kind of made the others disappear. We still have a stepping stone that you can step out and land on. We created separation by using an individual stepping stone. But we have one major room and one major hallway that connects back to the way that you come in and out. So I found out the program, I found out how they use the house, how they use the space, then I realized I don't want three doors from the house leading into this. We'll tone those down and make them look like windows and focus on the one main room, the one main hallway or walkway leading back to the house. I use hallway because that's in inside, especially those of us who grew up in ranches, hallways can have a negative connotation, they're dark and so, but, but we know that concept of you're going from one place to another. So outside, there are hallways too, even though they're not necessarily covered. And if you see in the foreground, those are two by two cut bluestone. So the patio is made out of two by two cut bluestone with a picture frame around it. So back to the floor, see how there's a, a solid blue band of bluestone around the outer edge. That's almost like the fringe on a rug or some rooms have a different, the grain of the wood will change where you're accenting the center part of the room. And then the blue stone in the center is a little more muted. But then we take those same two by two squares and we use those as stepping stones that connect to another outdoor sitting area on the right side. Part of this was budget driven, so we didn't do it all out of blue stone. We have a pea gravel patio on the right side. Part of it was they liked these looks. They liked the look of the pea gravel. They liked the look of this informal. But we started with space planning. Where are the rooms? What do you want to do with them? An outdoor sitting area, casual seating, and an outdoor dining area. What was so fun about this is they put those lights up on top. They hadn't used the space for years. They have teenage daughters. And if you have teenage daughters, you know life is, uh, life is just all great. So they, they, she sent me a text and said, my daughter walked outside, sat on, the, on one of the chaise lounges, and said, happiness is all around. And uh, I've always remembered that, because part of a, you know, we, we wouldn't be still doing this if we didn't love it. I mean, this is fun, it's great, but it's hard work. Doing this, you're working with people, it's hard work. Part of it is the joy that we get out of it. When somebody uses a space that they never used before and it makes their life better, that's fun. That's, that's part of the addictive nature to it. But in this case, it's a room. There's steps that connect you to a hallway. So here's another view back. See, it's a very long, linear space. Do you see the bench way, way in the very background at the end? So those timber walls were existing. We modified them a little bit, but that was existing. Well, we wanted a focal point for that room, so we have a long hallway, and at the end we have the chair. There's, where the chair is now is a little mini room. So we've created, what does a little mini room have? Well. We widen this path out a little bit. We put a couple pots, and they can sit out there and look back. So now there's actually three rooms, two major and a minor, and the blue stone is the hallway that connects them all together. Yes? Good question. You're a pea gravel area there. What do you use for your base on that? Pea gravel base, it's really, it's really, really simple. Uh, level it, get 2%. You get a little bit of cross fall. Uh, we edge it with a blue stone ruble. We tamp it. We have beautiful clay. We put down a half inch of a very small, coarse uh, Chattahoochee blend pea gravel that's angular, and it seats into the clay and sets up, and it's amazing. That's it. That's just sitting on clay. Sitting on clay. No, no liner. That, that creates a slippery surface. 
Has to be angular, has to be not, not round, that's marbles, and not thick. The temptation is to keep adding more, and it sounds like you're walking in snow. All right, back to the rooms again. You've got the main room in the background under the covered pavilion. Then we had a little sitting area off to the right, and then there's just grass with stepping stones in the lawn. They love it. They play out there on umbrellas. They hang outside. But we knew where the rooms were going to be. And then we have a path that comes down here in the foreground that connects you the rest of the way to the stairs around the side of the house. They didn't need concrete. They didn't need all this fancy stuff. We started with the rooms, and we figured out how much use they have and designed hallways, pathways that fit that space. All right, here's another room, room in a hallway, outdoors. This also is in keeping with the area that it's in. It's very rustic, so we use natural big pieces of flagstone set on a properly graded, compacted base. And we have boulder steps and flagstone pieces that are the pathway hallway. But we knew where we wanted the room. And incidentally, in a minute, we're going to be talking about ceilings. There was a 40-foot tree next to this, so it was a very open space. It didn't really feel inviting without the ceiling. You see, can you see at the top of the screen what's hanging there? You know what that is? Chandelier. chandelier. It's a metal rustic chandelier. That is the ceiling for the space. When you're in that space now, even though it's hanging 40 feet from a chain from a tree, it brought the ceiling down. Restaurants do that a lot. If you've ever been into a dark restaurant, ceiling can be 30 feet tall. Some of uh, Bob Amick, a lot of his restaurants, they're really good with lighting. All dark, each table has a tiny little spotlight or a little beam. So in a, in a cavernous space, every room feels intimate because the light created this bubble. It's the ceiling. It brought the ceiling down. All right, here's another area that, so this had an existing fence or screen of, all the way around it. That little arbor was there, and the steps were there. We added the pavers, we left the arbor, and we disconnected it from the driveway. So if you look in the foreground, those are stepping stones. So we wanted a little separation. They wanted to sit out front. They wanted it to feel like a room, but it still had to connect to the driveway. So they had this, already the wood uh, deck was there. We just enlarged the space a little bit more, rounded the pavers off so it felt like its own space, left the little archway so you're entering a room. That now is a front door room without all the walls around it. Here's a close-up of the... And that creates separation. Separation is a, really a big part of designing outdoor spaces because when you can create separation with disparate, disparate and different materials, it, it compensates for a lot of problems. If you try to put a patio right up against a house that looks like dirt and you start digging, could be a footing, could run into issues with siding, where you connect to the driveway, you're going to have old concrete butted up against new concrete or concrete against pavers. So by creating a separate room with one material, bridging that with an individual stone or a different material to connect to the driveway, we can compensate for slightly different elevations. We've isolated the rooms, the driveway, and the rooms. That's really a helpful trick I've learned over the years. And that has a little room by the front door as you come up. There's also a walkway that connects from that over to the driveway. So there's two different entryways to get to that front door. The major way is from the driveway. That's where they park the most. That's where their guests go. So the, the, the way off to the right is mortared bluestone. And again, it's, it's in the heart of, uh, well, it's Buckhead. Actually, that's Virginia Highlands. But it matches the house. Bluestone, major walkway to the right, minor walkway straight ahead. So I knew that I was going to design a major and a minor. It's the other part about if you do have a path or a hallway, you need to know, is this the dominant way people are going to go, or is it a secondary? And design it to inform people how to go. Part of your job is to understand how the space will be used and help guide people. So they don't wonder if you've got a nice wide opening that leads to the front door that's clean and, and open and inviting with colors, you're going to help guide people that way. So you have to understand what your job is in order to do a good job. All right, so let's go to walls. They're figurative and literal walls. Don't make them any taller than you need and include windows and art. They're walls, outdoors like inside. All right, so figurative, that little low boxwood hedge around the side, that creates an edge. That creates a plane that begins to come up. It doesn't need to go taller than that. They're pretty views, but that's the wall. That's the implied wall. 
In the background, they had a nice open space that they put some metal art because that's a real wall. That's a literal wall. You need both of those. And if you have a wall, a literal wall, what do you put on literal walls inside? Sometimes it's art, right? Same composition. So how do you design art inside? You want a nice focal area? You want it well lit? Do you want a composition of things? Those are where, those are the pieces that are really important, but the first step is understanding what your walls are and why you need them. All right, this one has a literal wall, a stone wall, that creates a lower terrace. There's a fountain, there's a little pea gravel path. That's a wall for a lower area. Above it, there's another room. It's got a, a wrought iron railing and a low boxwood hedge because the views from there are nice, but those boxwoods across there define the space. They create a figurative wall upstairs, whereas downstairs, it's a literal wall. And in this case, the art on it, we kept real simple, it's just a fountain. That's the same as a fireplace. It's, it is some implied art object on the wall. And the, de the decorating part really is a lot of fun because there's so much potential for outdoor accessories, decorating, driven by the purpose of the room, not just tchotchkes everywhere. I mean, I like uh, some tchotchkes, but they have to be well done. <clears throat> this is a seat wall. The fireplace creates almost a literal wall. It's tall. It helps block some views to the neighbors. But we planted some evergreens in the background that will block the house. So the seat wall creates an edge to that space and bring, begins to bring the floor plane up. I love seat walls for outdoors because they're double duty. They can make a space uh, more usable without filling it up with furniture. They're 18 inches tall, uh, anywhere from a foot to 18 inches deep. Great overflow sitting. But they also create the walls as a floor plane going up. All right, so this is real simple. It's fireplace, fire pit. That boulder wall creates an edge. It's also a seat wall. You can, use, you can sit on it as well, but it begins to turn the edge back up. All right, this is a trick I've done. There's two things about this. This is a driveway area that most people are going to see their driveway coming into the house more than any other part of your yard. So they had a, a sloping driveway that was concrete that was cracking, and we pulled it up, and there's a, a, a it's not there yet. We're going to set a bench back at, they might have done it by now, at the far right corner with some pots, and we created a change in pavers. The inner is almost like a rug or a carpet. The outer is a darker color, but the walls on the right side are screening a house to your right. But you only want to use a plant or a wall or a screen that gets to the height you want, maybe a little bit taller, but not much more. Because if you get in a space like that, if you have a plant that's 80 feet tall when it's mature and you've got a 20 foot wide space, 80 to 20, you're going to feel like you're in a canyon. You're trapped between the house, this green wall, and this little space is going to feel uncomfortable because you're losing the blue sky, you're losing the view. So as you're designing, Understand that you're going to create these walls, literative and figurative, and if you're screening, use only as much plant as, or wall as needed. Keep the blue sky, keep the openness. Now, there are times where I use plants that are going to grow too fast because they need an immediate screen, and I said, all right, in 10 years, I'm going to come back and cut these down, and we're going to do it again, and you're going to pay me a ridiculous amount of money to do that, and they're like, let's do it. Because that's that important to them, and that's their choice. But I tell them, what they're getting into by planting a plant that's going to grow fast and get too tall. It's so liberating. I used to try to be a people pleaser and tell people what they wanted to hear. And then I learned I'm a people pleaser if I'm more honest and direct because they get to the answer they need so much quicker. They're going to get there anyway because I'm going to try to make them happy. It's going to be a lot of work. In the end, it might not work out anyway. So now I'm just much more blunt and people seem much more happy. Go figure. Uh, here's a job where they wanted some privacy from the neighbors, but they didn't really want a big wooden wall. So we created these faux windows. They're actually just, it's wood, a uh, little bit of an arbor overhang that kind of creates the ceiling profile as it turns back. But those are just uh, one, two by twos, I think, that we ripped down to one by twos and sort of did this look of uh, mullions. But you just look right through it. They're just windows. But we picked up some of the paint colors, a little bit of the style of the house, you notice in the background, those plants are going to grow really tall because you can still see the house 
way in the back. So those need to get taller, but they're also farther away. But I don't want to use these right over here because you're going to block way too much of the view. I wanted this to feel like a room. So walls have windows. All right? Oh, and another thing, that grass, the grass is the floor. Lawn is the floor. So when you're designing even a giant lawn in the yard, think of it as it's the great room for the house. How do other things relate? How do they look into it? How does that space, how does the grass act as a floor plane? All right, ceilings. Wet versus mostly dry below, because 100% dry can be pretty challenging. I'm your biggest fan, and ceilings help to define the room. So above is uh, wet. That's an open space. Out in the foreground is wet. Underneath, that's a dry below system. You can furnish it differently, but ceilings can be many things. On the upper arbor, that little curved plane creates the edge of the ceiling up there. Plus the lights, again, those little uh, macaroni grill lights, you know, that, that are across there, those create the ceiling plane. So you can have wet or dry ceilings, open or mostly open. All right, here's another view looking back. This is actually the 3D version I showed you at the beginning, but we took out we value engineered the screen porch out because they had a completely covered area below. So we decided in order to get it all within the budget, they can stay more dry down below if they want it. But here we programmed all the different rooms. The fireplace room, see what the floor is on that? It's grass with stones between it. Too much hardscape. I can't just, they wanted a lot of rooms. You can't do the same material. So we changed the material, but the colors blend as you go up. Separation and height create separate rooms as well. So ceilings and coverings and open, different types of ceilings. So I'm your biggest fan. This is a, uh, an, more of a contemporary uh, covered space they wanted, fireplace and room. And that fan is really important because it, it does not only keep it cool, but it's a great way to fight mosquitoes. Two fans in particular, ceiling fans, do a really good job at spinning the air around enough that the mosquitoes have a hard time flying. You can use the mosquito misting systems, but the fans also help drop the systems, uh, drop the, the, uh, the temperature, and I, I like the look of a fan too, spinning in the summertime. And also the ceilings define the different rooms. So in this, we have the covered arbor, we have the fan that's in there that creates cooling, that's the kitchen area, that's a high top table you can sit around like you would have in a bar, but here's a different view looking back. You also have the exposed room. Same floor plane. It's a brick paver that runs under both. What creates the difference in rooms in this case is the ceiling. I didn't need to change the floor plane. I changed the ceiling plane. All right. The grill in the back kind of makes an edge wall. The house on the left makes another wall. This is by a swimming pool. This is kind of walls and windows. The ceiling turning that arbor over like that created the implication of an edge to ceiling to the space and the openings created views to the neighbors. She eventually, she hangs lights in it and she's got, we have vines growing up on them. Right, and here is a literal ceiling. Matches the architecture of the home. Comfortable cushions, nice place to sit. The floor plane on that is bluestone. They had existing bluestone so we enlarged it a little bit. It's hard to tell, but we pushed it out farther than the profile of the porch. See that? So your eye is drawn out into the yard. It's not just following the shadow line of the overhead structure. It's about what, what's your goal? You're sitting outside, be outside. Open the views up, create this draw, and so that curve draws your eye to the biggest space in the yard. As you look over to the left where the tables are, we went to a cobblestone paver that uh, is uh, more economical, but it also creates a different sense of the two rooms. So even though they're similar in color and shapes, by changing material and keeping the blue stone centered on the, this first room and making it look a little bit more formal, we changed the floor plane and the ceiling, and the ceiling plane to help create two different rooms. The blue stone is the floor plane. What really helps set this room apart is the ceiling. We wanted it open all the way around. We wanted some light, so we have a little cupola on top. We got the fireplace that creates a back wall there, but the floor plane stays the same. It actually does step down a little bit, but, the, but we already had the ceiling 
to create a different, a different space, a different room, so we don't have to have necessarily a change in the floor plane material. All right, so last. The building codes are changing a lot. They're, um, I don't know, 16, 18, 20 different municipalities that we work in, cities, county, uh, EPA, EPD, a lot of rules. I don't know all the rules. I don't know all the codes. Um, but I do know enough that I can inform a client while we're meeting and say, all right, well, let's talk a second about impervious surface. Somebody wants a patio. I'm the third guy they've met with. So I'm sure your other prospective installers talk to you about the, the risk with impervious surface, how you're going to need a permit. Oh, no, nobody mentioned that. Well, okay. They should have because whatever we're going to do is going to require a permit. So you need to understand what are the steps with permitting. Before you even hire me, you need to understand. And I feel bad for people because a lot of times that never even comes up. I don't know off the top of my head by looking at a site all the rules and calculations. I know trees are going to impact it. I know impervious surface is going to impact it. I know underground easements are going to impact it. I know building codes. I know, you know accessibility for certain things, for handrails, heights are going to impact it. I know enough to do a concept and get them a price. When it has to matriculate into permitting, uh, that's where I know I need help. But I always start with a survey because you're flying blind if you're doing anything outdoors. Every county has got floor plan, uh, uh, floor, floor area ratios. Every, every county has some requirement on you're not allowed to exceed lot coverage. Some of them don't really enforce it. And if you call them up and say, hey, I'm going to do this, is that okay? They might say, yeah, you don't need a permit. But technically you do because you're changing the square footage of buildable space on that site, of built space. So the survey shows underground utilities. It shows a lot of things. It's really important to get. And if they don't have it and they don't use you, they are better off because now they have a survey. I found all kinds of pe problems. People, they, th they thought their yard was twice as big as it was. People whose the garage was built partially on somebody else's yard, somebody else's home was built partially on their yard. Almost every yard I go to had something that they're better off knowing now rather than at some other time because of the survey. And you can get a basic one for five, six hundred bucks. You just, it's too easy. So the last part of this is, like I said, surprisingly, I don't know it all. And I tell my clients that right from the beginning. This, we're on a journey together. There's thousands of pieces. My job is a generalist. I know enough to pull the team together to do a design to get you prices and to make this happen with the best people. So I've collected the best people. My install crew, my masons, I've got a couple of architects that I call, I've got engineers, I've got remodelers, I've got everything you can think of when I need help, that's who I go to. So you need your team and they're part of your sales pitch. You need to know the people in the city. Some cities uh, Sandy Springs, great to work with. I call them up. I go meet them down there. They'll meet me on site. They're part of my team. I know them. I talk to them up front. They've told me, no, you're fine. Don't, you don't need a permit for that. Great. All right? But, but build your team. That is really incredibly important. And that's part of the opportunity that building codes can give you because they will set you apart from people who are purely avoiding them. And I'm no Boy Scout. I'm not going to say I followed every code, but I've tried to do my best, and I've always tried to inform the client what the risks are, what they're getting into in relationship to codes. So uh, this presentation we're going to post to Facebook. That's it. That's my website. Um, I, that's my website address. I really don't know what it is. I have a, a my, part of my team is my PR team, Sylvia Small and Tim Small. They're in the back uh, taking pictures of this. And they do all my social media. They do my email, my Twitter. Um, I do my email, unfortunately, but all, everything, Facebook, my Twitter account, my website updates, they do everything because that's not my strong point. That's not my thing, right? The worst thing you can be is good at everything because then you're going to do a bunch of stuff you shouldn't. Find what you're great at, do that, and then get people to pull into your team. Okay, that's my last bit of advice. So, time's up. Uh, questions, where's a, my, my proctor? Do I have time for questions? I'm going to say uh, yes. Questions? Yeah. OK. Thank you, Eric. That was very informative. And, and you brought it down to a very understandable uh, parallel for us, creating rooms, hallways, ceilings, and floors. That's 
totally, totally awesome. And and that that I hope you have patented that or copyrighted that or something, something like that because it, it's a whole how-to book in my head that, that you just <laughs> gave us. So thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. I found we tend to overcomplicate things. Um, so I appreciate you saying that. Um, and it, that's the, the teaching part is what's really helped me. If you, if you want to learn more about it, it's uh, Emory Continuing Education. It's Landscape Design Certification. It's six different courses, and we go through plants and hardscapes. And, but it's really brutally big picture, because that's if you start, you can get to everything else. But you have to start understanding what your job is. And your job is really to be invisible. When you leave, somebody should just say, oh my gosh, this is just beautiful. I love this. right? Not notice all the different pieces. I can, I can make you notice my landscaping really easily. I can use a thousand different types of plants and a thousand different colors and a thousand, and it can be completely wrong, but by golly, you noticed it. And that can be the temptation, especially you know, with those of us that have these enormous egos. The temptation is to be noticed, and it's really to be invisible, and that's hard. So. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.